Bonjour. Hello. Hello, Change Now. Hello, Paris. How are you today? Thanks for giving us part of your lunch break to listen to this amazing session. I am Sophie Bidwell. I will be your host for the next hour and a bit. And we're here to talk about a very important topic, which is resilience and adaptation. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a confession. So in my day job, I advise CEOs and boards on their strategies for positive change. And I'm also involved with a business called Springwise, which has been spotting innovators and their ideas from all over the world every day for the past 20 years. So I'm deeply in the topic of positive change every day. However, the topic of adaptation and resilience, I have to confess, has not been um, front of mind in the topics that I have followed. And why is that? Well, because maybe subconsciously, if I talk about adaptation and resilience, it means that I'm conceding defeat on the solutions to the climate breakdown. So why am I sharing this story with you? Because um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is about the psychology of change. And I've got five amazing speakers to talk about adaptation and resilience. And first on stage is Christian Clot. Um, Christian, I'm going to introduce you briefly, although this is very difficult. But Christian is an explorer. He is the CEO of the Human Adaptation Institute, and he has decided to dedicate himself to exploration and scientific research for over 20 years, all over the world and in extreme conditions. And the question that uh, Christian is on the quest to answer, I suppose, is that of the human capacity to adapt. So in 2014, he created the Human Ad Adaptation Institute to research and study human cognition and physiology in the face of change. Please welcome Christian for his keynote. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, of course, and I will try to talk to you. I just have two hours, so we don't have so much time. Sorry, guys. But I will try to talk about you. What is uh, the feeling of adaptation? I mean, we, we have some, some people talking about uh, the mechanicism and else. We work about the mechanicism, but today I will talk about the feeling of adaptation. It's a bit more than 20 years now. I'm leading expedition all over the world in all kinds of environments. Uh, it can be desert, rainforest, uh, polar area. I will talk specifically a bit about uh, the desert, uh, Dartelut Desert, plus 58 degrees, 3% humidity. That means that when you swallow some water, it doesn't reach the belly and it's evaporating before reaching the belly. That's interesting because we have plus 50 in India right now. Just uh, remember that. It's not something that you can really deal with. You have to try to find some solutions here. Uh, I also sometimes put some people in a cave to see what happened in the brain about time. And uh, of course, unfortunately, or fortunately, I know I work also on uh, uh, earthquake, tsunami, this situation where people are facing new kind of conditions. All these situation means that my life is facing changes where I never know what will happen sometimes in just one minute. If you go in Patagonia, in, a, in a Indonesia sometimes, Things are changing so fast, you're unable to just understand what's happening. And you need to cope with. Uh, and it's something really interesting because, of course, uh, if you talk about tsunami like the one in Indonesia some 20 years ago, uh, whole people can suddenly understand what's happening to them. It's so quick. It's so big. Uh, other situation, for example, in Africa. This is a nice place I went 15 years ago. And I went back there one year ago. And these places are completely changed. What can these people do? I mean, there are 100 persons living, farming there. What can they do? That's the question we have to ask. Not do they have enough food or else. No, what can they do? That's all the question I have with my institute, my research institute, about how we can gain information about human being, human behavior when facing this kind of situation. Extreme conditions. That doesn't mean extreme environment. Extreme condition, it's each time someone is facing a condition he doesn't understand. De disorientation. There's something suddenly happening to you, and you don't know what to do. You don't have information, you don't have keys, you don't have tools. It can happen when you lost a, a close friend or family. But it happens if suddenly your world is changing. And why world is changing? Because of environment, of course, climate change, pollution, all these kind of things. That's the first reason for your environment to change. Technologies is a reason to change also. 
And we had a uh, big technology change, it was digital, we had plane, we had cars, all that are changes. And of course, society. The number of per persons living in the town, the, no the amount of persons we have on Earth, all these kind are changes. But what is interesting is, it's the first time on Earth, on history of human being, that these three changes come at the same time. All is linked. And what, what we have to understand when we, call about adapt, when we talk about adapt, adaptation or resilience is not ju just because we are facing a problem. We're facing an amount of problem. Things are changing so fast. I mean, we change in a slow pace for centuries. We had some issue, but suddenly we solve it and it was okay. But now we're facing acceleration, increase, it's a craziness in a way. People will face changes, the amount of changes in one year that a human being were facing in one life just 100 years ago. What does it mean? What does it mean for us as human beings? What does it mean for us as a brain issue? That's all the question we need to ask. And this is the first answer. When you face a change, you have two strengths fighting in your brain. The first one is trying to really Welcome the change. We like changes because we learn with, with changes. A baby is a person trying to understand a lot of things, but also it asks a lot of energy. And in your brain, there's another part saying, don't change, please. Try something new, but after stop, go back to what you had because it's easier, because it's less energy. Changing needs a lot of energy, so it's not easy. Each person saying you just have to change, it's a wrong idea. You need to focus on to accept this change. Now imagine that you read in the newspaper this morning that an avalanche came down in Chimborazo, hitting the base camp and killing the 10 persons inside. Is this information important for you? A bit, maybe, not so much, 10 persons. Uh, what, what happened in Ukraine is much worse, what happened in Africa is much worse, so okay, it's just an information. Imagine now that the same mountain, the same orange, the same base camp, but you have your brother or your sister inside the tent. Then suddenly, this small avalanche, not really important for you before, changed your life. What I mean about that, we need to understand, it may be hard, it may be ununderstable, but it's true that people are impacted only by things linked directly to their own emotions. You won't help people to change if you don't hit the emotion of one people. That's something so important. You, you have to remember that. How can we help people to change their behavior, to change what they think about climate or any kind of changes? Find the emotion linked to that. And of course, it's not so easy. Once I was in Patagonia, in a place where weather changed really fast, I was with a small zodiac trying to find a, a way to climb a mountain, and I was hit by a storm, 300 kilometers wind, really fast. I was hit outside of my zodiac, I just, just fall down in the water, two degrees. In this temperature, two degrees, medicine said you have five minutes to survive. It's short. It was impossible for me to reach the coast in five minutes. So I began to swim, and after five minutes, I was so tired, my muscle was so painful, it was impossible to pursue, and I decided to let down. But suddenly, the storm pursuing, something happening, and the, the clouds changed in front of me. And I saw something in the cloud, it was this image. It was a painting. It's uh, the boat in the storm of William Turner. I remember where, where I saw this, this painting. It was in the bed in New York. I remember the person I saw the painting with, my love. And I decided that there was no way not to see her anymore. When I swim again, and I spent 20 minutes in the, in the water to get outside. What does it mean? Of course, I like Turner as a painter, but much more. You know, when you are under stress, under danger, we consider in the brain that there is three lines. 
First, it's comfort. You are normal. It's your life. Second one is major discomfort. It's a place where suddenly you are under disorientation. And the last one is death danger. When you face something new, like a tsunami, like something really big, really huge, at the beginning, you're interesting. You go, wow, it's new. I have to try to do something. But after, you begin to fall down and down and down. And sometimes, eventually, you will hit the danger zone. To get out of that, you need something. And it's always true. You need what we call now an epiphany. It's not religious. It's just something that push your attention to something you like enough to fight. It can be a memory, like the Met in New York with my girlfriend. It helps you to just focus again, to go somewhere, to gain again. But the thing is, that asks a lot of energy in your brain, and you will fall down again. So you need something more. You need metabolization. You need to help this memory or this thing to give you a reason to fight. And believe me, you never fight for something in the past, because it's past. And you never fight for something you dislike. If you don't believe there's a reason, positive reason to fight, you won't do it. That is metabolization. I thought about my girlfriend in the Met, but that's it. I decided to see her again, and that is the metabolization. If you want to make people change and adapt themselves and go back to something they can fight for, you need to give them a reason positive to fight. That is the difference. Is uh, I, I went back to my tent after swimming for 20 minutes. And this is the difference between resilience. Resilience is a nice thing. You need it. Anybody needs resilience. When you feel something wrong, when you had something bad, you need resilience as a human being to stabilize yourself, to find a way to be OK again. But that's nice for a person. It's never good for institutions or companies. You need to go more and further. The thing is, after a program, we're happy to be safe enough to pursue our life. But we just wait for the next crisis. That is the problem with resilience. You need the next step. You need to push further and to understand what will be the future and to anticipate more than that to influence it. That's the difference between resilience and adaptation. Resilience is something that helps you to go back to the normal way, but adaptation helps you to push somewhere and to understand what is the true thing you have to fight for. What is the true thing you have to fight for? I will finish with this image. This is a mountain in Patagonia, Monte Sarmiento. I never saw the top. I trade for 15 euros to climb it. I never saw the top. That's a bit the same for our future. We know we have a future. We know we have to go there, but nobody knows what it will be. We know that if we do nothing, it will be really bad, but we don't know what to do to, be, to do something good. Now we need something that maybe we have all here, but that a lot of people lack. It's conquest spirit. Not being in a, in, a, in a tunnel, not to see just one small thing and to fear all what will happen. Because if you fear, you're not useful. But you will need a conquest spirit, something that helps you to decide to fight. And what is a conquest spirit in this day? It's not to put a flag, a flag on the top and to say, whoa, I'm the best, I put a flag. It's imagination. You need imagination. Because it's the only way to consider what will be tomorrow. And if this tomorrow is good enough, OK, go there. But if you consider this future is not really what you want, decide to change. And never forget that for that, you need to be linked with your emotions. Because what does the brain is easy. 
If you have one big, strong knowledge, something you know, know for sure, with the only knowledge you're very sure about, about one thing, one, I don't know, one thing you do uh, usually, and this, this thing change, your strong knowledge only linked to the thing you know won't be really useful. If you need to fight for the future, you need a panel of knowledge. Because what happens in the brain? When you don't know what to do, when you don't have a solution to the problem you're facing, inside the brain, a lot of buses will come and go everywhere to find some small information, small ideas, to build a new knowledge and to use it to create something new for the future. The question you have to ask for yourself is really simple. Do you have enough, enough pieces in your brain? I saved myself because I saw a painting in the mat, not because I'm strong or better than anybody else. What do you have in your brain to build something new to change your behavior when you consider facing climate change, pollution, technologies, society changing, all these things linked all together that you will need to find solutions for, and not only finding solutions, but acting with these solutions. Thank you so much. Christian, thank you very much, so much in there. So what I take away from this is that change needs energy and change needs emotions. And in our next panel, we are going to have three speakers who are putting energy and emotions into their endeavors. And we are going to deep dive into the strategies and the solutions that are being adopted by businesses and cities around adaptation and resilience. So can I please welcome to the stage, stage sorry, um, Kathy, Elizabeth and Antoine, and I will give an introduction when we speak, sit down. Yeah, if you could each grab a microphone, great. So, my three panelists have um, such amazing CVs, I won't do them justice uh, through my introduction. So I'll just give a short introduction and, and then I will let them tell you their stories. So first we've got um, Kathy Bathman McLeod. Did I do that? All right. Um, so Kathy is Director and Senior Vice President of the Atlantic Council's Arch Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. You make it hard for me to you know, pronounce all these things. Um, and Kathy's big project is uh, she's working on the first ever uh, naming and categorizing of um, heat waves, which we do for hurricanes and other things, but we don't uh, do for heat. So you're going to tell us about that in a second. Then we've got Elizabeth Barjani. Elizabeth, welcome. Elizabeth um, is the Climate Adaptation Coordinator at the City of Athens, and she will tell us about the green corridors that she is um, working on. And um, finally, we've got Antoine Denois. Please correct me. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm French. I can't even pronounce um, Antoine's. Uh, that's a bit um, scary. So, Antoine, you're the CEO of AXA Climate. And the purpose of AXA Climate is to make planet Earth a key stakeholder for companies. And that's a short sentence, but that's a very big endeavor. So welcome to the three of you. And um, what I'd like you to do, because I haven't done justice to your amazing backgrounds, is to uh, tell our audience what is the path that led you to this stage today to talk to us about adaptation and resilience. So I'm going to start with you, Kathy. Thank you. These events always go by so quickly. And so I find that it's best to just jump right into the meat of it. And we're going to talk about extreme heat, and we're going to talk about the, th the threats and the impacts that climate change is bringing us, but we're also going to talk about the solutions, which is why everybody's here. Uh, in, in short, I love to do new things and think about things in a different way and how we solve this problem. And climate change can feel so big that we can't do anything about it. And one of the most recent IPCC reports uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said this report is a file of shame and broken climate promises. 
and we have to sit with that for a minute. That we're, we're not getting there, we're not doing it, and we can focus on solutions, but we also have to, with our eyes open, understand where we are. And that comment that he made is an accurate assessment of how we're doing on our emissions. But this panel is about adaptation and resilience, and so we, <clears throat> we look at the way the world is now, and we think about, let's adapt now, and humans are really good at adapting. And we're obviously not that great at taking on big, uh, massive challenges like climate change. And so there's an author, <clears throat> and her name is Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Has anybody read Ayana Elizabeth Johnson's book? It's called um, All We Can Save. And she says that I've stopped looking at the statistics. I've stopped reading those reports. I'm focusing on what I can do with my team, my work, and myself to contribute to the solutions. And I like that. And so today, I'm gonna to take a page from her book to think about what can we do going forward. But we have to start with a recognition of what's happening. So my uh, quick background, I worked at the Nature Conservancy, and I think that the biodiversity and conservation cons uh, conversation has to be a part of the conversation we have on climate adaptation as does equity and an understanding of historic um, <clears throat> human conditions as we try to solve climate change. I worked also in government for the chief financial officer of the state of Florida, where we were the first to disclose climate risk in 2008. Um, no one was talking about that, and I don't know if you'll know this um, analogy, but there are lots of tire tracks on my back for trying. <laughs> that wasn't a popular thing to do. Um, but now it is, uh, as you see, climate change disclosure for companies is quite standard. Uh, then worked with the insurance industry and um, colleagues in the industry of Antoine's at Swiss Re to create an insurance policy that covers a section of the Mesoamerican Reef based on its protective value of a $10 billion annual tourism revenue. So there are lots of things that we can do there using insurance and finance, but today I wanna to talk about early warning systems and about heat and the way we can save lives from the conditions we've created as a, as a people, we, our eyes are open, we have done this and what we have in front of us, we will have for at least 30 years if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases right now, 30 years of these temperatures, let's figure out how to survive them and thrive in them and I look forward to the conversation. Great, so we'll talk about heat when we talk about solutions. So Elizabeth, tell, tell us a bit about your path <laughs> to this stage. Right, um, I'm so happy to be here and uh, I'm so inspired with uh, this event. It's absolutely fantastic, thank you very much for having us. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that, well, I first represent the a local government, the city of Athens, and um, cities are the places, but also the systems that uh, changes happen and most the majority of population live and uh, they face the climate crisis, they face uh, the extreme heat temperatures, they face the flooding and they are the places that need to adapt the most. So basically, uh, for the, um, since I'm going to be presenting some real examples, you know, what Athens is doing towards this direction, in order uh, for cities like uh, ours, densely populated, densely built up with lack of green spaces, heat is a problem. It's uh, the number one danger uh, for the city of Athens, the, most clim the, the biggest climate hazard. So um, we need to see this in a systemic way and we are doing that now. We're changing our mentality and we see the green inf infrastructure as a system uh, integrated with mobility. Um, we create green corridors in the city of Athens. We're building them now. Now we have a small pro no, we have a, a project regarding the city center with a great big walk is happening, um, uh, with, uh, which enhances uh, active mobility and uh, green corridors in the city center, linking archaeological spaces. We are also tendering very soon uh, a project which is really extremely important for the city uh, on local scale, on neighborhood scale, connecting green spaces of the city 
uh, with the assistance from the European uh, Investment Bank called Natural Capital Financing Facility. Uh, and uh, that uh, reflects to uh, reducing the heat uh, risks for the city of Athens by creating green corridors and also increasing the biodiversity. But what I really want to talk about, which hasn't happened yet, uh, we, propose, we put in a proposal uh, for 100 million euros uh, for creating a metropolitan corridor in the city of Athens. And that's really interesting because it has to do with water element as well. And Kathy, you probably know about that. It's the uh, footprint of the uh, Roman Adrian's aqueduct. You probably never heard of it in this audience, uh, but it is uh, an aqueduct that runs from the mountains of uh, Athens, northeast, into this, right into the center, bringing 1.5 million cubic meters of water in the city uh, center. So it's a great opportunity that this, the footprint and the infrastructure, the most resilient um, work that uh, underground and uh, old work that we have in the city of Athens to be managed and uh, used for uh, adaptation in the city, not only for the city of Athens, but for the neighboring uh, uh, municipalities. It runs, uh, we are cooperating with the region and the municipalities in order to create a huge investment uh, regarding uh, creating uh, more parks, more cooler parks of the city, uh, creating more cycle routes, and using the water of the aqueduct for irrigation, for irrigation purposes and for cleaning uh, purposes of the city of Athens. Kathy, um Thank you. Uh, amazing. Uh, I need to leave some time for Antoine to, I, I need to tell speak his also. story. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much for the question. Um, AXA Climate, we were launched uh, four years ago. We are mo now more than 100 team members. And the key question uh, to connect with uh, Christian Clo uh, keynote is the energy. Where does uh, our energy come from? Uh, first, it comes from an assessment. I don't know if you know this quotation from the insurance space at four degrees, the world is not insurable anymore. And the key question mark at the beginning for us at AXA Climate was to be able to give an answer to this big question. And uh, for that, we need adaptation. And I think that uh, the key uh, epiphany, uh, to go back to your, uh, your quote, uh, uh, Christian, uh, was this ability to uh, collectively at AXA Climate to shift from one definition to adaptation, of adaptation to another one. First, at the beginning, we thought of adaptation as a, a kind of defensive concept. Uh, to be adapted for a large corporate, it means uh, uh, to build uh, protection against floods. It means to reduce uh, ecological footprint, uh, to reduce carbon footprint, uh, which is very important and it should be a top priority. But the epiphany for us comes from this idea of uh, having a, a more higher level of awareness and to think that uh, to be adapted uh, for large corporate, it means to have a huge transformation of the business model itself. The key question uh, for the adaptation is to be able to reconsider the way the value is created uh, and seen across organizations. And for us, it means that this value now for uh, adapted business model should, increase, uh, should include ecosystem, should be ecosystemic, and should be net positive. So for us, what does it mean? Uh, adapted, um, ad uh, adapted uh, business model, it means net positive business model. And it's the way, as an insurer, the way we want to support the transition is to be able to support this adapted business model, this net positive business model at the end, uh, at the end of the day. Great. So Christian said it in his keynote, we are all resistant to change because that is how our brains function. And so my question is, when it comes to adaptation, you know, it, it's a topic that hasn't yet had its maybe epiphany in, in the corporate and, and leadership world. Um, do you see that? How has the narrative around adaptation evolved? Where, it is, where is it in its maturity curve and how much work do we still have to do to make sure it's top of mind? I think there is a t for us, there is two uh, very important layers of uh, levers of action across big organizations. Is the top management and local people. I'm going to caricature it a bit. At the top management, what we see as a key driver of success to succeed in this transition is to uh, do what we call valuing impact. Progressively to make understood across organizations that the PNL should integrate 
uh, natural and social capitals. We need to uh, measure the impact and progressively to have decision making based on a larger view of value, not only financial value. So there is a huge uh, need from the market on this topic. It's key to change the decision across organizations. And what do we need for that? We need science. Because at the end of the day, it's all about physical boundaries. It's all about how do we understand science in order to progressively uh, embed uh, social and, and, uh, and natural capitals uh, across, um, across the PNL. And at the other way, at the other extreme, local people, our strong conviction at AXA Climate is that the adaptation is local. So we do not need any global standard. Uh, it's not like that. It's not a top-down approach. We just uh, need to uh, comply with a simple rule, is to let local people take local decision. And when you think with this kind of mindset, it requires a huge revolution in terms of culture, because you know that we like hierarchy, we, we like uh, to have top-down approach, and, uh, and we like sometimes bureaucracy also in our organizations. So the idea is really to put local people at the, at the forefront. And what do we need? Because our question now at AXA Climate is what can we do to help local people? Uh, and for us, it's training. Uh, the key impact that we can get is if we are able to scale training programs in order, very simply, to be able to say to local people, to bring awareness about what's going on and to give them the one, two key question mark to have themselves in order to take uh, uh, the right and, and local actions. So we, we try at AXA Climate to bridge a gap between these two extremes, valuing impact at the top level and uh, training for local people. Thank you, Antoine. Cathy, maybe can you comment on how hard it is to push the adaptation uh, narrative in, in your work? Adaptation ha is uh, 40 years behind the mitigation efforts, and 6% of global climate funding finance goes to adaptation. So just to give you a sense, uh, we're behind. And part of that is the metrics, and part of it is the complexity of adaptation. And adaptation is messy and local and multi-headed, and we have to just jump in and it's gonna be a mess and we just have to do it. We don't have time to get it just right. I think we wanna take the Pareto principle and say 80-20 is fine. We have enough research, we have, there are plenty of um, the, the, the finances there. We need projects and the project pipeline is the, um, is the mother load. That's the thing we're really looking for and we have to adjust expectations about what that means and that idea of a last mile is that local governments and um, local communities, and Antoine said it really well, it's local. And so local uh, communities have to set their priorities and you have multiple benefits coming from adaptation projects, but in mitigation you have a sole metric and that is how many metric tons of carbon have been avoided. Single metric, really easy to understand. You have, um, you have a rate payer base when this is an energy transition, so there's a, uh, the financing model is pretty straightforward, and so we're in the adaptation space looking at the benefits tables. You know, you have economic benefits, but you're not gonna have the financial returns that we see in a mitigation energy transition portfolio, and so we just have to get comfortable with that and just get in there and get our hands dirty mm -hmm. and learn from it and share as quickly as possible, um, but get busy. We're it's urgent. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Elizabeth, so Athens is doing it. You're doing these amazing projects that you described. What do you think triggered that energy and that, and that action for the city? Well, first of all, it's the, um, it's, it's the real problem. It's the heat waves and it's all the crisis that we face uh, that led us to that. Well, um, breathing clean air and uh, being in a shadow, sh shady place and leaving the city uh, as a local uh, is something that um, we imagine, you know. Um, more green spaces uh, provide a lot of health benefits and in a few years from now, the city will not be livable if we continue like that. So um, it's, uh, it's an amazing opportunity for the city also to increase the green spaces but also to improvise and make use of financial tools that um, uh, we participate in. For example, we now are one of the 100 uh, cities for the EU mission for neutral, neutral climate cities and smart cities. So this is mostly for mitigation purposes, 
but we, tr we will try to in uh, integrate adaptation measures into this proposal that we're coming, and that's really, really important yeah. for us. So it's, it's really also driven by experiencing um, the change and the heat. So talking of heat, I know that, Kath sorry, you want to say no, something? No, I have a good one. example, a concrete example of successful adaptation that can tick the boxes. It's not only to reduce uh, bad stuff, it's drip irrigation for agriculture. Uh, when you put drip irrigation, you solve the issue of water scarcity, and also you increase the yield of the crops. So uh, keep in mind this kind of positive stories of adaptation because you can have thousands of positive adaptation stories that just not reduce bad stuff, but increase good stuff. <laughs> Net positive. Cathy, I know you're dying to talk to us about heat and the work you're doing there, so the I floor just is yours. <coughs> the, the time is quick, I know, and <laughs> I, I want to say, um, just know this, and this is part of the challenge of heat. It's silent and it's invisible. So if you think about, you know, if I say Katrina or Sandy, you know, those of you who hear that context probably think, oh wow, I know that's the one of the biggest hurricanes that the biggest hurricanes that hit the US and cost billions and billions of dollars and lots of lives lost. But when you think about heat waves, heat waves in the US killed 20 times more people in 2020 than did hurricanes. And your iPhone will shut down at 95 degrees Fahrenheit and um, 32 degrees C. And an airplane can't fly at 120 Fahrenheit, which is 49 C. So we will have significant disruptions because of the temperatures. Our bodies aren't ready for it. Our infrastructure is melting. A million sea creatures boiled in their own shells during a heat dome heat wave in the Pacific Northwest of the US. So we need to move quickly to build our awareness and they don't rip the roof off of your house the way a hurricane does. They don't make for great television. And so we need to name them and we need to categorize them. And so we are rolling out heat wave naming in Spain and we're working, Athens is our partner, on categorizing heat waves so that you know a category three heat wave has these health effects to this community, to your community, and it tells you exactly what to do. And so the baseline of adaptation, in my view, is um, about vulnerable people and the people most experiencing these impacts did the least to cause them. And so the minimum we can do is help save lives. And we think that if you name a heat wave and our mission is to name them all around the world. And so it's very standard. We name the heat wave and you categorize the heat wave and all category three heat waves get a name and then you know what to do because the, the warnings come out. And so I didn't want to leave the stage without saying that because you want a concrete solution and this is one of them and we are rolling it out and I want everyone to support us in doing that. So everybody in? Yeah? <laughs> you. Okay. All right, good. <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> so Kathy, thank you for th sharing that. So, so this is obviously the North Star that you're working towards to categorize uh, heat waves and, and, and therefore you know, bring awareness about the importance of heat. Um, if I have to ask our other panelists what they're working towards, so what's, what's the North Star and the big objective that you're trying to achieve in, in your work? So we want to switch uh, as many business models possible from large corporate, from traditional business model to regenerative business model. For that, we are ready to do uh, all what is needed <laughs> at AXA Climate. So we are ready to ensure what is not insurable. <laughs> we are ready to train uh, as many uh, employees uh, possible. So we are working on an MBA for regenerative business in order to uh, educate also new leaders tomorrow. We are ready to uh, do some studies uh, in, in form of consulting, of course, but just to project organizations in 10 years' time if what is going to happen. And we are also ready to finance uh, key uh, solution of adaptation in order to unlock money for very important topic uh, at the top priority uh, being agriculture. So we are ready to do what is needed and count on us to fight for it. Cheers to that. <laughs> Elizabeth, what's your North Star? What are you trying to achieve? Well, I think it's really important to, for, for cities and for governments to change the way they work. I really agree with what you said about the culture, about the work culture and the mentality that people have in, in their institutions. So um, in, in our department, for example, we break up the silos of the local administration and we work horizontally with all uh, aspects, with the private sector, with the other departments of the city of Athens uh, uh, and also with uh, the civil society. So that uh, the building capacity, building the, uh, having more, to, um, more uh, specialized 
uh, and trained people in the culture of the city is something that we really focus on and we want to work horizontally and uh, bring out the message for what is important and what is not to, to invest and focus on as a city. Thank you. Okay, we're coming to the end of our session, so I'd like to end on a hugely inspirational high, please. And wait, 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 I'm not finished. So, um, so this is my last question. Um, if I give you a megaphone that the whole world can hear, what would you like to say in it? I'm going to start. You don't know. Alors, you do we know. <laughs> we need to do a massive cultural revolution across our traditional organizations at the first level, uh, our big corporates. So massive uh, cultural revolution, be brave and let people, uh, local people decide. Okay, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth? Well, um, I was really inspired with what Christian was saying, and I do agree that um, uh, you change when you love something and, when, and you also change uh, when um, uh, you want to protect yourself. So basically, um, that's uh, something that I would like to to focus on and just bring out this message. I thought that this was very inspiring for us. Very Thank right. you. <laughs> <laughs> Name the wave. Name the wave. Okay, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Kathy and Elizabeth Altman, thank you so much. Right, the grand finale. I am very delighted to welcome Sonam Wangchuk on stage. Sonam, I'm going to say a few words about you before you um, come up. So Sonam comes from the Trans-Himalayan region of Ladakh in India. He is an awardee of the Ramon Magsaysay um, Awards. This is the Asian version of the Nobel Prize. And he has been working in the field of education reform for over 30 years. He's a climate change activist, and with his students, he decide, designed some of the most incredible solutions to the climate crisis that he's going to tell us about. So please welcome, welcome Sonam Wangchuk to the stage. I'm dying for a bit of water, so I'm going to do that as you settle. All right. Would you like some? No, it's okay. You're okay. okay. I just need a few drops. Whoops. Thanks. Right. Where am I sitting? Here? Here. Maybe turn a little. Yeah. Voila. There's no problems. There's only solutions. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sonam, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. So, your, your roots are in education, really. You've been working in, uh, for education change for over 30 years. Um, this here, we're here to talk about adaptation. So can you explain to us the path that leads from education to adaptation, please? Well, to me, education is always about the challenges that the people are facing and to find solutions to them. Education is not a set ritual that has to be done if the problems change. So when we were hunter-gatherers, perhaps education was to you know, be fit and be very skilled at hunting and gathering. When we settled as farmers, education was to make the most out of the land. And then uh, much later, industrial revolution came when production was important. So people adapted to that and trained people to extract the most out of nature. And today we are faced with the outcomes and consequences of that, which is uh, much more than what it started. So education should be about adapting to that. And therefore, it's only natural and no-brainer that education should be about whatever is the current challenge. And our current challenge is not more food to waste, more clothes to fill your wardrobes, but to uh, bring a balance where all living beings live in harmony in nature, and therefore, education must adapt towards adaptation of lives uh, of human beings on this planet. And that's how I think uh, we saw that in the mountains of uh, Ladakh, where I come from, it's on the Tibetan plateau across the Himalayas yeah, in India. Um, we saw it more uh, stark there, the effects of climate change, and it was natural to engage students in finding solutions uh, through 
adapting to the mountains for, in our case, yeah. Sure, so can you just help the audience connect with, with maybe the picture of um, what, it, what it feels like uh, where, where you live and where you're in the communities you're, you're helping in terms of the impact of the climate breakdown? What is it actually feeling like? Yeah, I think it is very important because uh, you live your lives in Paris and New York and New Delhi. Uh, we see the consequences of your actions up in the mountains. Uh, we are at the forefront of uh, climate change, uh, it seems. So I'll just give you some examples. The only reason why life is possible on the mountain deserts of Ladakh is our glaciers, kind of fossilized water from hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Otherwise, life shouldn't be possible there. If I look out of my window in Ladakh, it looks more like Mars or Moon. The main difference is that we have some glaciers, uh, ice from decades and centuries. And now, with the global warming, these glaciers are melting away very fast, and they are not just going away quietly. Of course, as they go, it causes uh, droughts. Every spring, there's shortage of water because these glaciers are getting smaller and smaller. But much worse, they're leaving behind flash floods and droughts alternatingly. So to give you a taste of it, 2006 there was a big flash flood in the village where we have our school in the valley. And I went as a volunteer to help the families affected. Several families had their houses washed away, people had died, farms were all gone. And I asked an old man in the village, I said, uh, when did you last see such a flash flood? And he scratched his head and said, I have never, I have, uh, since my childhood, I've never seen but heard of such things from my ancestors or elders. That was 2006. Next was in 2010 when roughly 1,000 people disappeared and many more houses were washed away in the main city of Leh in Ladakh. And the next one was 2015. The next was 2017, something that the old man had never seen. So that's the frequency of uh, flash floods. And each flash flood takes away all the fines and of the soil and vegetation, which are what absorbs any water, and then the next flash flood is, uh, even if it doesn't uh, rain much or glaciers don't melt, there's nothing to hold, so it's a vicious cycle. Thank you for describing that, and uh, I'm sorry to do this to you, everyone, but I think it's really important to hear the real stories of, of, of what's happening because of the impact of, of what we're doing. So, however, we're here to talk about solutions. Yes. So, and you've, you've come up with some incredible solutions. So tell us about some of the innovations that you've been working on with your students and, and in your projects. Yeah. Uh, more than innovations and adaptations, I think we need to actually redefine things that we do today in 21st century. So education itself needs to be redefined to lead to solutions to our problems, as I said. And therefore, we try and engage young people in the solutions using their chapters in the textbooks. I, uh, uh, together with others, started a school that was for those who were failed by the system. You know, the criteria of admission in our school is not your marks or grades, but that you have failed Brilliant. in the system. And uh, they have amazing capabilities that the system doesn't recognize. So in any case, it's always good for students, uh, normal, natural students like these, to be taught in practical, applied, hands-on ways. Um, and while doing that, we would apply, for example, uh, the chapter on heat, conduction, convection, radiation, which children memorize and be done with the exams, to apply, and that way we could build houses using uh, conduction, convection, radiation, and a little bit of geography to know where the winter sun is in the northern hemisphere, which is what geography teaches. Applying all these knowledge, we were able to build houses that stay at plus 
18 in minus 20 Ladakhi mountain winters using nothing but sunshine, which we have enough. So um, you can adapt and apply what is in your textbooks to not extract and damage nature, but to, to live happily and heal nature, and that's what we do. Um, other things would be using gravity to you know, farm at the school. The children produce their own food, vegetables, they keep cows, but every time they take charge of milking the cows, they use mathematics or statistics from mathematics to track, track the productivity of the cows and they make their bar charts and pie charts to express uh, what they learned. So it needs to be adapted that way. Um, one of the favorite uh, innovations at our school that I like is we treat the school like a little country uh, with a little government, a little parliament, a little election, and a government that runs for two months. And they take charge of the school as a country um, and learn about life, how to be ready for life and be uh, you know, active as soon as you school, uh, leave school. And they are very much in demand in society, in business, in politics, in leadership, and so on, these students. So one of the things as a country we have there is that the school has its own time zone, which is one hour ahead of the Indian Standard Time, where we are. And I always say this has nothing to do with uh, separatism. It's uh, only practical, and it's the best way to put teenagers to sleep early at night, not too long after dark, and wake up early in the morning with the sunlight. And that um, makes such a saving of energy. Uh, and I say if 7, 8 billion people of the world just went to bed one hour early and got up one hour early with the sunshine, they could save or close many nuclear power plants and coal power plants. Yeah? Um, just by sleeping, you could save the planet. How cool is that? There you go, yeah. real solution. <laughs> but, but, there is a big but. We did it as an innovation at our school. Then I thought, well, this is nothing different from the daylight saving hours that Europe and many countries have. And that's a great adaptation and mitigation, mitigation measure to climate change. And then what I hear from a European friend is that, but sadly, European Union is considering scrapping that. You know, here I was saying, if China and India also did daylight saving hours, imagine the number of power plants that could be shut because of this one hour of intensive energy use. I think this is a very retrograde move uh, if Europe, <laughs> our model, suddenly disappears. So I think this conference should send a loud message that such uh, adaptations that were done maybe um, you know, early 20th century should actually be reinforced rather than given away. And the reasons were that there are, people are confused. People find it hard to get up early uh, in spring or winter, whichever. Those are such small reasons. So I really think um, countries like China, India should join daylight saving hours. And please don't let your governments um, change this, but the governments change when people want that change. So it says that 2018, 4.8 million Europeans uh, voted for scrapping this. It would be a very uh, backwardly move. So such um, innovations, which are not even innovations, I brought it up with our school because you can then see the value in it, but you are already doing it. Mm, similarly, uh, coming to innovations, as I said, our glaciers are melting away very fast, uh, thanks to global warming, which we have nothing to do, but we cannot escape the consequences. Uh, so we, a few years ago at our school, said, how about freezing the water in winter in the streams that go waste? Because in winter, nobody farms in a cold place. But there is a stream that flows even in winter. Now, if you freeze it, then you could keep it till summer when there's such shortage of water. But everybody laughed, you know, how can you keep winter ice till summer 
it uh, will melt away by March. All snow and m m ice is gone by then. But to our help came geometry. So we made ice, or we froze the unused water flowing in the Indus that would otherwise go into the Arabian Sea, um, not just as flat ice, because that would melt by March. Geometry teaches you, school geometry, that there are shapes like spheres and hemispheres, or even cones, that have low surface area for the given volume. So we said, how about freezing our ice in one of these shapes? And cones are very easy to do. So we made huge cones of ice that are like 10 stories tall and store millions of liters of water, 10 to 12 million liters of water. And sure enough, these uh, cones or pyramids of ice last till June and July, slowly melting and giving the water for planting trees and helping in farming. Because these looked like uh, beautiful conical white uh, shapes that resemble uh, something you see all over the Himalayas and Tibetan Plateau, a spiritual monument called stupas. I don't know if you know. We said innovation should not end with the lab. Uh, we should also make it close to people's hearts, so we called it ice stupas. And suddenly people took to it, spiritual leaders uh, you know, blessed it, and elderly people started prostrating and <laughs> adopting it. So innovation can be in various forms, and uh, these are small uh, innovations that help a little bit, but much more needs to be done. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. So we were talking about this before this session, and you're doing some incredible work at, at local level. Um, what, does it, what does it take to make change happen at scale? What are some of the lessons that you've learned on your journey to help push the change at scale? Yes, so I used to think with my students that uh, these uh, ice stupas that are made, by the way, without any pumps or power. It uses only gravity to make water rise. Another school science that water maintains always its level. So using simple passive forms, you make these. Or the solar heated buildings that would mitigate um, emission and pollution. But now I have come to learn that it's not to do with uh, technical innovations. It should not be left to scientists and their laboratories. It has to be a social uh, movement. So it, it has to penetrate um, spiritual, religious discourses. It has to penetrate politics. And therefore, if you follow or you can look up, uh, two weeks ago, we took a block of melting glacier from the mountains of Ladakh, the highest in the world, a uh, motorable road called Khardongla. Uh, we took it down to Dharamsala to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and presented it on, on Earth Day to give a message that uh, spiritual leaders uh, should also join this discourse. Because you like it or not, more people listen to religious leaders than they do to scientists and engineers. Yeah? So we have to change that. And Fairly so, because all religions in the world, worth the name, talk of peace, non-violence, ahimsa. Now, violence, long ago used to happen with daggers and guns and stones, and therefore it was made into such a big issue, because that was a huge issue. So religions and education address the problems of the time. We are missing that. So I say... That violence is gone. If you look up on the internet, as I was doing, causes of death, unnatural death, violence of physical kind comes to some 26th or so. It's no longer the problem. The first three causes of unnatural death are lifestyle and environmental related. So how can religions and spiritual leaders not address what is current? If you don't, I say, your churches and temples will be empty. If you address what is affecting people, then your 
um, you know, your uh, discourse will be heard. So therefore, religion and spirituality needs to bring it as a major form of sinful activity. When they talk of sin and virtuous activity, today carbon is sin. <laughs> and enhancing oxygen or sequestration of carbon is the most pious activity. So these need to be redefined and adapted also. Similarly, politics. We can't just only, you know, um, use the bicycle and not the cars. Very good. But we have to also um, network and group and organize ourselves together to make us heard by the powers that be. And democracy is such that you can't expect the leaders to take steps. You have to first be organized yourselves because in a democracy, leaders do what people want. If you keep wanting what destroys the earth, then leaders will never ban those activities or put restrictions. So uh, politics needs to change. Similarly, defense. You know, when I make these artificial baby glaciers, people say, you are doing something interesting, but where's the, where are the resources to fund such uh, initiatives? And I say, well, you have so much, such huge resources to fund such things, and what? It is the defense budget. Defense needs to be redefined. It's no longer India against China, China against US. Those are little differences like two neighbors fighting about the fence when a tsunami is coming and going to hit them in two minutes. You don't fight about your fence then. So <laughs> defense should be about the big challenge that the whole world faces. And if you put the world's defense budgets, sure enough, there's enough money for action against climate change. So that's how we need to adapt and redefine these issues. Thank you. Lots of wisdom there. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sanam, I'm afraid we've run out of time. The clock is running red now. Um, so what I'd like you to do, please, if, if you have one maybe mantra, one, one, one message that you would like to leave the audience was very quickly, that would be much appreciated. Uh, mantra, I don't know, as all of these things that I was saying are the base of it, but a message that I want to bring from the mountains of uh, Ladakh where we are hit by um, climate change is that our little baby glaciers are of no use for us. We are not proud of them. The real solution lies with you all in big cities like Paris, London, New York, Beijing, New Delhi. And the message that I always um, give to people is that please live simply in the big cities so we in the mountains may simply live. And Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam. I cannot possibly say anything more after that, so thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Change Now. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>